Awesome. Hi, Karen. Okay. Hi. So uh, Dr. Desenso is here. Dr. Desenso, do you want to take it away? Yes, welcome everyone. Thank you for bearing with us for that minute as we got our speaker on. I uh, want to thank you very much for coming to this. Uh, what is this? The, the fifth in the series of uh, our continuing education program on special care dentistry. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, just some introductions. We do have Dean Myers, Dean of Toro College of Dental Medicine here today. Um, and uh, I'm director of special needs at Toro and also co-director of fellowship that we will mention to address oral health disparities. And we also have, who's sharing our screen with us right now, Dr. Raquel Rosdalski, who's our director of anesthesiology. Also, we've been doing this series in concert with the OPWDD New York State Task Force for Special Care Dentistry. So we wanna say a thank you to Rito Bilello and Elizabeth Capral. Thank you very much for uh, coordinating with us on this series and we are uh, happy to be continuing this into the next year. And just a note, um, of course, it's, it's very important to um, continue to understand that um, as we move forward, we're looking for consider, co continuing opportunities for being able to provide to um, uh, the special needs uh, population and to provide access to care. Uh, we do have a, a non-taxable donation opportunity if you'd like to support the special needs fund at Toro College of Dental Medicine. Uh, so you're very welcome and we would appreciate um, anything that could be given if that is of your interest. Um, we've been very happy to um, have opportunities uh, moving forward in education uh, to have uh, grants and funding, uh, which actually has been uh, led us to be able to uh, start a fellowship program, uh, which I'll just mention briefly to you um, as I welcome everyone and thank you for coming. <laughs> I thought the fellowship was a nice one, but thank you so much for everyone. There's always been so much support um, for this series and uh, it would take uh, probably half of the time to thank everyone who's who's been involved over the time. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone who has been involved and who continues to be involved in making this series a success and uh, continuing the network for everyone who's working towards this end. Thank you. Um, so just a brief mention about the uh, NISAC Fellowship to Address Oral Health Disparities. Um, it is a fellowship program that launched last year uh, through NISAC that involves all of the six uh, dental um, educational facilities in New York State. And uh, it started out with um, a, a grant from Mother Cabrini Health Foundation, and we've received New York State funding for this year to continue the uh, fellowship. We have existing um, rolling um, applications as we speak. Um, pay, students, uh, fellows would be uh, providing direct care in clinical settings that specialize in serving people with IDD with experienced dental faculty mentors. 20% uh, of the time would be devoted to teaching and or research at one of the New York's six academic dental centers for the duration of the fellowship year. And following the fellowship year, fellows will commit to one year in practice settings in New York State with significant special needs patient populations and continue their teaching and research uh, responsibilities. So if you do have an interest, as I mentioned, they are having rolling applications and you can visit the NISAC website. I think we do have it here. If you'd like to take a screenshot, I think if you click one more time, oh, maybe not. We'll provide that information for you if you want it. Um, we can very readily provide that to you, but most especially uh, you can easily find it on the NISAC Fellowship uh, website. And on to the main event. Uh, I do want to thank Karen Raposa so much for being here today. Uh, Karen Raposa is a registered dental hygienist. She holds master's degree in business administration and is currently a regional manager for the academic team with Hugh Freedy Manufacturing Company. She has authored articles on a variety of dental subjects and has co-edited a textbook titled Treating the Dental Patient with Developmental Disorder. In addition, her work has been published in Dental Clinics of North America, the Special Care Patient Publication. 
Karen is currently a member of the advisory board for the NYU Dentistry Oral Health Center for People with Disabilities and for Project Accessible Oral Health. She has extensive experience in the academic world as a former assistant professor in Boston University's Department of General Dentistry and was awarded the title as one of the top 25 women in dentistry. We are delighted to host Karen here today. Karen, thank you for being here and sharing your experience and expertise. And now I pass the floor on to you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeCenso. And, and thank you to Toro College of Dental Medicine, to all of you for the honor and privilege of being able to participate in this series and be able to, being able to share uh, the information that I have and that I have gleaned over the years with uh, a combination of life experiences as well as my education as a dental hygienist. And so um, it really is um, so wonderful for me to be able to have this opportunity. So I'm going to ask if um, Toro, uh, the objectives are here listed for you. If you could stop sharing, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slides with you. And one of the things that's really a challenge with this presentation, I will start, start off by sharing this, is that this information is generally presented in a three-hour format. So <laughs> I am a fast speaker, but I'm not quite sure I can speak twice as fast as I normally do. So I, the good news is that everything I am presenting on these slides is available to you as a handout. So please don't feel like you need to copy the slides. Um, I will ask that you allow some privacy for some of the personal images that you will see on the screen. Uh, as this it, part of my story is my personal story when it comes to Alzheimer's and autism. But every word that you see on the screen is available in the handout. And very often I may show a screen and say, you have this in the handout, I'm not going to read the screen to you and just give you a very top level of uh, the information that I have to share with you. Uh, there are a couple of videos here, and so I will ask, um, hopefully we've done some testing, but then I dropped off. We had some technical problems. So um, I can see Dr. Myers on the screen. I'm hoping someone will chat me or tell me if I say, here's a video, and you're not hearing any sound on that video. But we should be good to go. Uh, I, as you heard in my bio, I always disclose that I am a full-time employee of Hugh Freedy Manufacturing Company. Uh, there will be no product endorsements here. If I talk about products that are helpful with this population, a variety of those products will be presented. The good news is that this topic has nothing to do with what I do for Hugh Freedy. So what I'd like you to start by thinking a little bit about is you all, I know, everyone on this meeting tonight knows someone who is affected by either Alzheimer's or autism. You all do, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, a neighbor, or even a patient that you had that it may not have even said that their diagnosis was autism or Alzheimer's on their medical history, you just knew that this patient was affected. So how do I know? What is my experience that tells me that I know a little bit about not just dentistry, being a dental hygienist, but about these two conditions? So you can all laugh. Uh, this is an image of the Farrah Fawcett hairdo back in the 1980s, early 80s, late 70s. Um, I was making my confirmation. Uh, and this is my maternal grandmother. And how I know a little bit about Alzheimer's is I want you to look at my grandmother's eyes. So I was about 13 or 14 in this picture. My grandmother's eyes were full of life. Uh, you can see her engaging with the camera and with the person who is taking that image. But when you look at my grandmother's eyes, when she started to enter her 94th year, so she really did well for a very long time, but you can see in her eyes that there's something missing. Um, it's just something's not there anymore. And so I know a little bit about Alzheimer's because I supported my grandmother for, for many, many years as her condition deteriorated. I also know, though, from my paternal grandmother. So this is my mom, my dad's mom. And here is where she was already being affected by Alzheimer's. And again, her eyes, um, when you compare this, and that's uh, my daughter, myself and my daughter behind her. But when you compare her eyes there, 
to before she was being affected, um, you know, there's a difference, right? There's life and there's engagement with that camera. And this is um, one of my children. This is my middle son. So I had to really learn a lot about Alzheimer's and really what that looked like as my grandparents, my grandmothers deteriorated. Uh, the scary part is when we look at some of the statistics, I kind of know if both of my grandmothers were affected by Alzheimer's, I kind of know when my mom's going to be affected and probably when I will be. So that's kind of a scary thought. Um, but how do I know anything about autism? Well, here's my grandmother. Now, really, she had not started to deteriorate here. And look at her eyes. Look at the engagement. And this is my youngest son. And so my youngest son, Tommy, was diagnosed with autism just before he turned two years old, which is really pretty young. I just knew at a very early age that he wasn't developing correctly. And I insisted on some speech um, and language testing. And uh, so he was diagnosed, the average age of diagnosis for autism today is still about five years old because that's when an individual is being screened for kindergarten. Uh, so when my son was diagnosed, again, I knew a lot about dentistry at the time. And I realized I needed to become an expert in autism. I really needed to know everything I could to be able to get him the supports that he was going to need throughout his lifetime. Uh, so this is a bit more recent picture of my son, Tommy. Uh, we loving, lovingly call him Tomo. His uh, uncle nicknamed him Tomo. Um, still loves balloons until today. But part of the reason I share my story when I give this presentation is you know, when it comes to a patient with Alzheimer's or autism, if you've met one person with autism or Alzheimer's, you've really only met one. With Alzheimer's, there, there are phases of deterioration and it's pretty common, um, you know, for throughout um, people with Alzheimer's, except you don't, you don't know how quickly the disease is going to progress. With autism, these individuals are so incredibly different that if you've met one person with autism, that's it. You've only met one. And I really feel like it's important that as dental professionals, we have an opportunity to understand the lives of these individuals outside of the time that they're in the dental office with you. Because the more you can learn about what these individuals' lives are like and and how to learn more about their lives. They're not necessarily going to be forthcoming about that. The more you know about these individuals, the more success you're actually going to have in treating and helping them get the care they need. So why should we all know a little bit about autism? And before I go on, I do wanna just ask if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. We're gonna do our best to make sure we've got some time at the end of this presentation. But for those people who have to be done at 8.30 and you need to sign off, uh, I will at least have your questions in that chat and I'll try to look at it every once in a while to see if there are some things I can address. Very often I will address them in the next slide or it's I can't address it because we just don't have enough time to do it in this presentation, but I can always get back to you with that. So why is it important as dental professionals that we all know and understand as much as we can about this patient population? Well, you may not realize it, but as a dental professional, we have the ability to profoundly affect the quality of life for all of these people when they need our services. And when I say profoundly affect the quality of their life, can you imagine having a toothache and not being able to tell anybody that you do? Can you imagine how you would behave? Can you imagine how you would feel every day, every moment of every day. So for the simple fact that we can keep people out of pain, <laughs> we have the ability to profoundly impact the quality of their life. And that's why it's so important that we all know and understand how we can help patients in this population. You know, what was fascinating is the more I learned about Alzheimer's and compared it to what I already knew about autism, it was shocking how there were so many things that were common to both of these conditions. One simple thing is the more you get to know an individual with Alzheimer's or autism, the more successful the dental visit is gonna be, period. And how we learn about these individuals may be different than how we learn about our typical patient. 
Another commonality, compassion <laughs> is most of what it takes to provide care or at least help these individuals get the dental care they need. Compassion is most of what it takes. Behavior guidance, I don't use the term management. Um, I don't know if there's anybody in this um, course this evening that likes to be managed. Uh, I think most of us would agree we don't prefer to be managed. Um, and so be behavior guidance is um, a more uh, appropriate description for what we're trying to do. We're trying to help guide these behaviors. And these patients actually would prefer that we help guide them through their dental appointments. This technique works with children and works very well in general with people with Alzheimer's or autism. Tell them what you're going to do, then show them what you're going to do before you do it. Very, very powerful and simple technique for both of these populations. Shorter appointments and more frequent. So keep it short and sweet, but it has to happen more often so that it becomes more routine, more common, not unusual, and so that we can focus on prevention because that is the critical element here. If we can prevent these individuals from ever having pain, ever needing anything other than a prophylaxis, we have profoundly impacted their quality of life. Communication is going to be challenging in both of these populations, but it is critical. And so how you communicate with someone with Alzheimer's and autism is going to be different than how you communicate with a typical patient, but it is critical. And you very often will not be able to even describe the rewards of helping these individuals through a successful dental visit. Those dentists who are doing this on a regular basis will tell you that feeling is indescribable when you help someone who needs it the most. So we've got a lot to cover. We're going to look at, define, recognize some of the behaviors of Alzheimer's and autism. We'll look at comfort zones and how we can possibly modify some of the treatments that we provide. We're going to talk about home care and if we have to refer what that might look like. And then we'll wrap up think, talk, thinking and talking about the long-term impact, not just on the patient when you're able to help them, but the long-term impact it can have on you and your practice. So what do we know about Alzheimer's? We know it's a brain disease. We know it causes a slow decline in memory, in thinking, in reasoning skills, and in behaviors. And it is the most common form of dementia. So it is a form of dementia. And the second most common form of dementia is vascular dementia. And that is what occurs after a stroke. So this is what we know. Let's talk about some facts when it comes to dementia. Alzheimer's disease. The patient can live 20 years or more, depending on the amount of brain tissue that's affected. So you will see these patients and could see them for a very long time before they are at a point where they can't come to your office anymore. So you have the opportunity to develop a relationship with these individuals before they are so profoundly impacted that they're not able to see you anymore. But a vascular dementia patient usually lives only up to three years. So there's a big difference there in how long you might be able to provide care. And sadly with dementia, the cause and the cure still are unknown. There's another commonality to autism, right? We don't know the cause and we don't have a cure. Some statistics, it typically occurs after age 65 with the prevalence increasing as an individual advances in age. So from age 70, the prevalence of Alzheimer's doubles about every five years. And by 85, more than 40% of individuals in this country will have developed Alzheimer's disease. That's 5.2 million people in the US. And the prevalence is predicted to triple based on the rate of diagnosis by 2050. So in an average dental practice, seeing about 2,000 adult patients, it's predicted that in that practice, there are about 46 patients with Alzheimer's disease at some stage. I always put this slide up and I, you know, just remind you, 
<laughs> some days we all think we might be developing Alzheimer's. So, you know, just don't worry if you missed the monthly payment or you, you forgot which word to use. <laughs> that is not necessarily a sign of Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, again, you will have this slide. I'm not going to read it to you. It is in your handout just so that you know the typical signs of actual Alzheimer's and dementia. But the diagnosis um, <laughs> kind of makes me think about autism too. There is really no um, scientific or medical way to diagnose autism. And with Alzheimer's, you can make a clinical diagnosis within 90% accuracy, but only by excluding all other possible causes. So you look at the patient history, you look at, um, you do a complete neurologic workup and mental status assessment, and you do exhaustive testing, right? Ruling out everything else because the only determinant to an actual diagnosis of Alzheimer is by autopsy. So what are some behaviors associated with Alzheimer's? And again, as I look at this, I say to myself, autism. Aggression can be common in autism as well as Alzheimer's. Being very agitated or anxious, common to both conditions. Confusion, maybe not so much with Alzheimer's. Sometimes incorrect medication diagnoses may cause that with someone with autism. Um, depression, common with autism, especially people who um, are less affected by autism and are very aware of um, how others perceive them. Hallucinations with Alzheimer's, not so much with autism, not so much suspicion with au au autism, but with Alzheimer's. Sleep issues, definitely with autism and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's patients tend to be very nervous when the sun is going down. So the need for repetition, common for both Alzheimer's and autism, and wandering, common for both Alzheimer's and autism. So when I look at this list, it just, the brain is just so fascinating with some of these similarities. So things to consider with Alzheimer's that what we know is that as the condition progresses, the susceptibility to dental disease is gonna increase and patients may be taking lots of medications that are making the situation even worse. They may be, those meds may be causing xerostomia and vomiting and gingival overgrowth or tardive dyskinesia. Medications prescribed for dementia have the potential to cause adverse reactions, even when combined with the medications that we use in dentistry or that we might prescribe in dentistry, including some of the anesthetics and antimicrobials. So we really need to understand what, medi get that medication, that comprehensive medication list of what they are taking and understand if there are any interactions. So again, I'm not going to read this slide. This is available to you in the handout. It really just talks about when you look at the early to mild disease stage, I mean, these are patients that are, you're still going to be seeing in your office, remember? And remember, from early to severe could be about 20 years so there's still a significant amount of time where your focus and your concentration needs to change as a dental professional, but you still have the ability to provide care for these patients in your office. When they get to a moderate level, right, the more we can get preventive, preventive, see them often, see them often. We learned that repetition is important to someone with Alzheimer's. So let's work with that. Let's keep their oral hygiene care repetitious. Let's, let's see them on a repetitive basis often, 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 so that we don't let, let it be, you know, 20 years that they're not getting care at all. We can reduce that amount of time and be a real advocate for this patient population to help keep them out of pain and give them quality of life for as long as we possibly can. All right, so let's shift gears to autism. I talked a lot about the similarities already. What is autism? And I know it's a bit confusing. You've probably heard autism spectrum disorder. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, and what that word spectrum actually means. But really what we're talking about is a group of developmental disabilities 
we know it has something to do with the brain development. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Alzheimer's is the brain deterioration or changes to the brain, right? These individuals with autism, their, their biggest challenges that they face are social and communication. And so we have the ability to work with that and to help these individuals, especially when it comes to communication. These individuals do have unusual ways of learning, so they don't learn like a typical person might. They may look like they're not paying attention. Be very careful with that, because what I can tell you from experience is while that individual may not be looking at you, it does not mean they're not listening, and it does not mean they're not understanding. So we can't assume with this population that if they don't look, that they're not understanding. Nothing could be further from the truth. And the reaction to sensations is where we have the biggest opportunity in dentistry. If we can help reduce some of the sensory input that occurs during a dental appointment, we can help these individuals have successful dental appointments. And I'll talk a lot about that. So just some other thoughts, you know, I don't know if you knew that more children will be diagnosed with autism this year. If you put all those children that were diagnosed with autism here, there will still be more children diagnosed with autism than children who are diagnosed with AIDS, diabetes, and cancer combined. Still more children will be diagnosed with autism this year. The latest statistic that was published at the end of 2021 and the way that this information is gathered has not changed. We are now at one in 44 children under the age of 21 being identified with autism. We know boys are four times more likely than girls. And so that means one in 27 boys diagnosed with some form of autism. And when we compare that to other conditions that we might be a little bit more familiar with, the only one that comes close is cerebral palsy, and that's one in 357 children. Okay, this is a scary number, one in 44. It keeps going up or down, depending on how you look at it. That number has gone since 2004. And so every two years, it's the, the data is gathered. It's gathered the same way. It's through the um, AADMD methodology. Don't have time to talk to you about those details today, but if you trust me, um, I can tell you that the way that these numbers are gathered has not changed. And today we've gone from one in 166 children to one in 44. And just like Alzheimer's, they don't have a medical detection for it and we don't have a way to cure it. So it's a developmental delay. Speech difficulties we talked about, lack of eye contact we talked about. These individuals actually prefer to be alone. So for the fact that we're gonna bring them into a dental office and be right up close with them, <laughs> that alone makes it difficult for that individual. And many of these individuals don't understand danger. They don't understand that if they run out into the middle of a highway, they could be killed, that if they put their hand on a hot stove. And so a lot of what we have in our dental environment can become dangerous. And we need to be thinking about how do we keep that individual safe through that appointment as well, if this is something that we need to consider. I get this question often, are there other conditions associated with autism? There is a long list. Um, and so again, I won't read that to you, but you've probably heard, and this does not mean every person with autism has a comorbid diagnosis. They may not, but these are some of the common comorbidities for conditions associated with autism. So when I say it's a spectrum, let me try to clarify that for you a little bit. And the best way I can do that is when you look at these four categories, when we talk about a spectrum, what it means is that an individual with a diagnosis of autism, when you look at all four of these categories, they could be anywhere along the spectrum. So if we think intellectually, that person could be a savant, okay? They could also be profoundly impaired intellectually or they could be somewhere in between. And that same person, when we look at speech and language, they maybe can't speak, okay? Or they can have a full-blown conversation with you, mostly about what they wanna talk about, <laughs> but 
a conversation, or they could be anywhere in between. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples to put this into real life. I don't know if anybody loves watching The Big Bang Theory. It is one of my favorite TV programs. Sheldon, on that program, if you don't know him, I'm going to describe him to you right now. But if you know him, you'll know what I mean. And I would say that Sheldon is an individual who has autism, um, but he's not heavily affected by it. Okay, he's pretty independent. And so let's imagine Sheldon is standing here and my son Tommy is here and they both have a diagnosis of autism. But Sheldon's brilliant. He's a um, physicist, uh, astrophysicist or something like that, right? Um, my son, now I think it's, it's very hard to test him. So we really don't know what his IQ is, but we know it's pretty low based on some of um, his understandings or non-understanding of things, right? Same diagnosis. Sheldon can have a conversation with you. He will struggle with sarcasm. You'll hear it in the show. He doesn't understand when somebody's being sarcastic. He only wants to talk about what he wants to talk about most of the time, but he can speak very well. And my son has maybe 50 words that he could speak. And most of you wouldn't know what he was saying when he said those words. From a functioning standpoint, Sheldon's really independent. He works, he dresses himself, he cooks for himself. He just doesn't like to drive. My son will need someone to care for him for the rest of his life. And from a temperament standpoint, Sheldon's pretty intense. Uh, he's highly reactive. He has an opinion about everything. Um, and my son is pretty passive. I wouldn't call him intense or highly reactive. So both the same diagnosis, right? And you can... An individual can be anywhere on um, the spectrum in any of these categories. So I want to take about a minute and a half to bring you into the homes of families who are raising their loved ones with autism. And I want you to watch because I'm going to share with you just a little bit about communication. If you knew what was going on in these homes, you could probably be so more helpful, so much more helpful in your recommendations. So you, I'll play it up until you see the parents trying to brush their loved one's teeth. And if you want to watch the entire video, it's called Autism Every Day. It's available at autismspeaks.org. Uh, and so it's, you can watch this entire video there. It's about six minutes long. So I will need, um, Dr. Myers, I can see you. So if you can give me a thumbs up that you can hear it in just a sec. really take a day off of autism. Autism never took a day off on me. A lot of ways, she's like a baby. She's just bigger. Dad. She needs constant attention. She can't be left alone crying, for a no, minute. She always has to have crying. my attention. And it's, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. In one year, we had three kids who were diagnosed with spectrum disorder. He used to take his clothes off a lot, and, and we're working on that. He doesn't speak much at all. He has never spoken a single word. Everything about Daniel's life that seems normal for a typical kid, like going out to dinner or, or going to a park, all that for us is work. Oh, a little bit more, I'm almost done. You know, just this moment, it dawned on me that the first time I watched this video, my son was about six years old. Today, he's 23. So all of these children today are adults. And I wonder and I worry where they're getting dental care today. Uh, these, you know, we're going to talk a lot about children, and we do talk a lot about children with autism. But what we have to remember is that they will all be adults. And while we have a lot of pediatric dentists who will help um, these individuals very often can't be seen in a pediatric office because it's just not safe 
when they become adults and they have more complex medical needs. So in this video where you saw the parent trying to brush the child's teeth, I often remember when I was in clinical practice as a dental hygienist and I would ask caregivers, you know, how often do you brush your loved one's teeth? And they, they knew the answer. They knew they were supposed to say two to three times a day. And I'd ask the, about the F word, you know, how often do you use floss? And as soon as you say it, they look at you like you've got six heads. Like, are you kidding me? How could I ever do that? And what I learned is it really was not helpful. So what I learned to do was ask them to tell me about the experience that they have when they use a toothbrush with their loved one. And in this case, if I had asked that question, this family, I hope, would have said to me, well, we use a power toothbrush because we we're told it's the best thing to do. And we do it in the living room because he won't let me do it in the bathroom. And he's on the floor in front of me and I'm going at him with the brush and he's running away. If I got that much information as a dental hygienist or a dentist, that's incredibly valuable because <laughs> there are some real simple things that you could suggest for that family. And you can find them in this document at specialolympics.org. You can just print this and just talk about positioning. First of all, pat that family on the back for using a power toothbrush because they're going to get so much more done in that little window of time with the power toothbrush. But a lot of this is just about positioning. If they just turned their loved one around and had their back to their belly, like either here, what's shown in this illustration, or any of these options, they have more control over what's going on and can probably have much more success. But I wouldn't even know to recommend this if I had not asked them to tell me about the experience they're having. So a lot of it is about just learning and asking open-ended questions and listening. So I'm not gonna read this to you because as we talked, we don't know what causes autism. There are tons of speculations and theories. We do not have an answer. Remember, you can find anything you want on the internet. Doesn't mean it's true, right? Scientific evidence is what we're looking for. So we don't know what cures it, what causes it. And the scary part is we don't know what cures it, and some of the stuff on this screen you can find on the internet that will say this actually cures autism. And many families will try anything, whether it's been scientifically proven or not. And some of this can be extremely dangerous. And the answer is we do not have a cure. A lot of these things listed here in the educational behavioral intervention are helpful. They don't cure autism. Very often people with autism are on medicines that can be helpful. Sad part of that story is once these individuals are on these medications, sometimes they're on them for the rest of their lives, whether they still need them or not. And some of this stuff at the bottom can be dangerous. Chelation can be very dangerous if it's not done properly. So we don't have a cure. But I want to share with you. I try to read everything I can that's been written by someone who has autism because my son can't tell me what it's like. He can't tell me how it feels. And many people with autism can. So this was written anonymously by someone who has autism. And they were asked to use the word autism. Okay, you'll see it spelled down the left-hand side of your screen. Tell the world what you want people to know about people with autism. The first thing this person said is autism is something I have. It is not who I am. And so I have never, this is a personal choice because I'm Tommy's mom. I've never said he is autistic. It's okay for a mom or a brother or sister or another family member to refer to their loved one that way. That is a personal choice, but it's not okay for us as medical and dental professionals to refer to patients by their condition, okay? This is called person-first language. I have friends who have diabetes who hate it when a nurse or a doctor calls them a diabetic. This is what we should not be doing in medicine and dentistry. It is actually considered dehumanizing to call someone by their condition. And so we have to practice saying it out loud. If all you've ever said is my patient is autistic, 
you will continue to say out loud, my patient is autistic. So please practice out loud. My patient has autism. They are a person who has autism. I think this cartoon says it best. The medical professional is saying to the person in the wheelchair, so what do you prefer to be called? Handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? And he says, Joe would be fine, <laughs> right? So I am a person who happens to have a condition. That's what this person wants us to know. Then they want us to know that they're unable to always tell us how they feel. So if they can't tell us with words, person with autism, if they're not able to tell us with words how they feel, how might they tell us? Maybe they'll grab our hair. Maybe they'll bite themselves. Maybe they'll hit the wall, right? Maybe they'll give us a good smack. <laughs> that is their form of, of, of language very often. Behavior may be the only form of language for that individual. So tell me exactly what you mean, right? Tell me, show me, then do it, right? And then I want friends, but I don't know how. Imagine if you could be a friend to that person. I can tell you people with autism, my son included, if he could tell you who his friends are, he might say his brother. And then he might say the people who care for him, who take care of him, or a therapist, maybe. And these individuals don't know how to, even Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. Sheldon didn't make friends. Sheldon's roommate, Leonard, forces all of his own friends to be friends with Sheldon. Okay? And Sheldon's very high functioning. Here it is again. My senses are easily overloaded. So we've got to talk about how do we reduce that sensory input for these individuals. And my meltdowns are hard for everyone. And a meltdown is not a person who is acting this way to try to get, to get something. Meltdowns come out of nowhere. Meltdowns are similar in some ways to seizures. You could do an EEG on someone with autism who's having a meltdown and you wouldn't see any change. So that's where they're different, right? A seizure, you do an EEG, you see a change in brainwave activity. But here's how they're similar. People who have seizures don't always know that it's going to happen. Sometimes it comes out of nowhere. Same thing with a meltdown. When a person is having a seizure, is there something you can do to make it stop? No, it, you gotta, it's going to run its course. Same thing with a meltdown, can't make it stop. So what's the one thing you can do for that person who is having a seizure? You just try to keep them safe, right? Try to keep them from biting their tongue, try to keep them from getting hurt during the seizure. Same thing when a person is having a meltdown. So it's kind of fascinating um, that there are some similarities there. <laughs> so this is Tommy. He's, as I said, uh, just turned 23 years old this month. And I have to tell you that most of the time when people see Tommy, they assume there's not much that he can do. They look at all the things that he can't do. And not often do people say, tell me the things that Tommy does. Tell me what he likes to do. Tell me all the things he's able to do. And if they asked, I would say, gee, you know what? I wish there was a special X Games. We have special Olympics. I wish there was a special X Games, right? So these are like the um, skateboarding and uh, dirt bike riding and all those types of sports. Because if there was, Tommy could actually compete. And this is his his brother took months and months and months to teach him how to do this by himself. And you can hear the joy in his brother's voice. Go, press it. Tommy, do it, go. <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. Right, so this is, you'd look at Tommy and say, you would have no idea that this is something he was able to do. Now, of course, his brother was looking for somebody to ride with him, so that's why he really wanted to teach him how to do it. Uh, but 
people would look at Tommy and never believe that he's actually able to ski and has been doing this since he was very, very young. Tomo! <laughs> wow, look at you. <laughs> look at the enthusiasm in the high side. <laughs> very little enthusiasm, but so thrilled to be able to do that and to have someone to support him to do that. So keep that in mind. We want to concentrate on what these individuals are able to do. And in order to impact their life and improve the quality of, the, of their lives, we have to avoid crisis management. This is with both populations, patients with autism and Alzheimer's, and that really means we need to focus on prevention. And so we're going to talk a lot about what that could and, and can look like because you might look at this and say, that cannot be Tommy's teeth. Karen, you've known what to do, but what I'm telling you is I'm not with him 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And he was being rewarded in school with food. And it was an ABA program, which is very, very common for autism. It's the use of rewards and repetition to teach someone how to do things. And I had no idea this was going on all day, every day, and it was food. It wasn't even just candy. Candy was once in a while, but never allowing that saliva to do its job and get back to a basic pH. So very high risk for caries in both of these populations for some different reasons. But even when we look at individuals with Alzheimer's risk, think about the impact you could have, right? We said early on, in the Alzheimer's disease process, we can still be providing care for these patients. And look at this study that was conducted at the University of Kansas. They found subjects that who were eventually diagnosed with Alzheimer's actually tested positive for periodontal pathogens years before that diagnosis. So if we could prevent perio disease in those patients, would it be safe to say they that we might slow down the progression of Alzheimer's or at least improve their health outcomes and quality of life? I mean, that's a big question, but prevention could do that. So let's shift gears. Let's think about comfort zones, right? The comfort zone for the patient and the comfort zone for you as the practitioner. So let me give you a perspective of being a parent and caregiver. When I take my son for a medical or dental appointment, I don't want him to grab somebody's hair, to hit somebody, to have an outburst. Right? So I am pretty much a wreck and I need your support. I need you to tell me that it's gonna be okay as much as I need you to tell my loved one that it's gonna be okay. But if there was one thing that I would beg and I do beg, and I have most of his medical and dental professionals will do this for me. We have a conversation about Tommy on a phone call the day before or the morning of his appointment. I get out of the way, any updates to his medical history, anything I'm worried about, any complaints I think, is he having any pain? I'm going to avoid having that conversation when he's in the room with me because I know what's going to happen. If he's in the room with me and we're talking about him, his level of anxiety is going to go up and up and up and up. And then you're going to try to perform a dental procedure on him. I don't think so. <laughs> so it's really important when possible, have that conversation with the parent or caregiver either the day before that they're going to come in for the appointment. So you have your plan, you know what's going on, or the morning of, so that when they show up for the appointment, you are ready to go and you can just concentrate on and provide care for that patient. Keep in mind, families and caregivers may not always be blood relatives. My husband and I have become very acquainted with direct support professionals. These are people who provide care for our son every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I can tell you it is a thankless job. 
most of the time, these individuals are not given encouragement. They're not told that people admire the work that they do. Most of the time, they're told what they're doing wrong and how they're not caring for these individuals properly. And unfortunately, a lot of times that comes from the guardians of the family. So if you have a patient who comes with a caregiver who is being paid for that job, they're a direct support professional, tell them you admire the job that, they, that they're doing. Tell them how much you respect them for what they do because you need their buy-in, right? You need to develop a rapport with them because you're gonna rely on them to take that individual with autism or Alzheimer's back to where they're living and to perform oral hygiene or to help other people perform oral hygiene. So it's really important to develop the relationships with the caregivers. And I don't know if you know this, but you can actually measure the effects of stress on the human body. And you can do that by measuring, um, by looking at glucose regulation and immune function and mental activity slash acuity. Individuals, families who are raising people with autism, when you measure these levels of the effect of stress on their body, research shows that their hormone levels are similar to the hormone levels of soldiers who are in combat. So think about that the next time a parent or caregiver comes into your practice with their loved one and how much stress they are under 24 hours a day, seven days a week and what they need, the encouragement that they need from all of us. So erring on the side of patience and kindness um, is crucial. Actually, the Alzheimer's Association at alls.org, this is uh, one page that they have that is dedicated to caregiver health. And you can select topics, you know, you can do a stress check and see how you're managing your stress levels. Um, this is really powerful and I think it would even be effective for um, families who are raising loved ones with, with autism and really thinking about how to help those caregivers and what resources can we provide for them. So what might treatment look like? What might we want, want, want to modify? What might we want to consider to help this patient population have a successful dental visit? Well, a lot of what we need is shorter appointments. I talked about this earlier. It's all about establishing trust. You've probably heard the phrase, people don't care how much People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. So people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And this is all about establishing trust. We want that parent and, and caregiver to know how much we care, that we want their loved one to be healthy, um, to have a good, good quality of life. And one of the ways we can show them that is by asking them a lot of questions about their loved one. You know, there are many, I call this one example of a patient information form. There are many out there, many hospitals have them. Um, the uh, University of Washington has actually developed a patient information form. It's a form of motivational interviewing where you actually might need to do it with the caregiver if the person who is affected can't be in the room to answer these questions, but learning as much as you can about that individual in all of these categories can prove to be extremely helpful in, in getting you to a very successful dental appointment. So the form is generally have a section on medical information. It certainly does not replace a medical history form, but you certainly want to know if it, what medications they're on, if they have seizures or not, if they have allergies or sensitivities, and do they independently use the bathroom? Important for you to know, um, right? We don't wanna be asking if the person needs to use the restroom when maybe they're not able to do that independently. The section on dental experiences, you know, what have their experiences been like before they came there? That's gonna tell you a lot about how they might behave if they've only had bad experiences. The daily experiences, don't ask them about tooth brushing and flossing. Ask them to tell you about their daily experiences with a brush 
What are their daily experiences with floss? How much do they think their loved one will tolerate? What do they like about the oral hygiene that they're getting today? Do they like the toothpaste? Maybe you wanna have that same toothpaste available with, for them. And then have the conversation. And again, this is beautiful if it's done outside of the appointment time, not at the appointment time, because you wanna know what the expectations are. You wanna set those expectations and make sure everybody's on the same page. Then there's a whole section on oral habits. So people with autism, I know a young man who will only eat Domino's pizza and will only drink orange juice. That's it. And he makes his mother buy it when it's half cooked. So, and she, he has to watch her cook it the rest of the way in the oven. Okay. So we want to know what does the overall diet look like? And we need to understand that with Alzheimer's, these individuals may not recognize food anymore. The people who care for them may not even know that they have dentures, right? Never mind whether they're fitting correctly or not. Um, they may not be moving much anymore. They may not be smelling and tasting. And sometimes that's a side effect of the medication that they're taking. So in this diet section, you want to ask, are they on a special diet? Many people with autism may have celiac sensitivities. So they may be on gluten or casein-free diets. They may have some aversions to certain textures. They may have speech therapists, kind of scares me, who are using foods to stimulate speech. So we need to know that as healthcare professionals, if we need to talk to that speech therapist to help them understand the damage it could do to the dentition. And then ABA I mentioned earlier, this is extremely common in the autism population. So I want you to see what that looks like. This is an example of ABA. My son is learning his colors. Can you see the colored gummy on each card? So she's picked up a card and she said, Tommy, what color is this? And he's named it. And then she says match. And when he matches it correctly, she gives him that gummy. And this is how he learned his letters, his numbers, his colors, even how to smile. This is a common form of teaching. We need to learn if the patient is being taught this way. And we need to at least write on a prescription pad or on your office head letterhead and send it home with that patient so that they can put it in the medical record. That person should not be rewarded with food while they're in school. That is a doctor's order and you can prevent this from happening to another patient. This is how my son ended up with a blown out tooth and you have the power to stop this because he, after we learned that this was happening, he would be rewarded with a light up toy or music that he liked to listen to, or he'd get to get up and jump on his trampoline. It should not be food. Many individuals with autism may need to chew. So if find out what they're chewing on, make some better, healthier recommendations that you see on your screen. Again, this is all in your handout. You don't have to write all this down. Um, many individuals with autism or intellectual disabilities have pica. We need to know if they have pica because they may be eating toothpaste. And when you look at the list of some of this stuff, right, you could understand families will say, don't eat that, don't eat that, don't eat that. But if they see their loved one eating toothpaste, they might actually think it's okay. We put it in our mouths, we swallow it. They may not realize the fluoride should not be ingested at those doses. So we really need to dive down and ask if they have pica and help them understand why toothpaste is on this list, should not be ingested, is not safe for ingestion. There's a whole section on physical functioning. Again, some people with autism may have limitations here. They may not be able to dress themselves and feed themselves. Other people with autism may be able to do those things. If they can't put their own shoes on, and here you are recommending they're gonna brush independently, that doesn't make any sense. So we need to know where, what the answer is for all of these categories. And then we need to think about sensory input. It are dental appointments, right? What are we putting in the patient's eyes? What sounds are the patient hearing? What, our office smells like a dental office, let's face it, right? You know, you go home, you've worked all day, your loved ones probably are immune to it, but early on they said, 
you smell like a dental office. There's a distinct smell that you don't smell in the home. Um, they have to taste things, right? That they don't typically taste. Just your gloves are an unusual taste. And we have to touch these patients. So how do we reduce this input for people with Alzheimer's and autism? Well, maybe we don't use an overhead light and we don't use a dental light. Maybe we just use a headlamp like you see in the photo, reducing uh, the, the sight input. Maybe we reduce the sound input with blocking the sounds or switching the sounds to a white noise machine that just goes shh, right? You ever sleep in a hotel and you turn that fan on all night so you don't hear the people up and down the hallways. <laughs> this can work in a dental office. The power of music, and of course, it's got to be music that the patient likes. Um, my husband's grandmother did not suffer from Alzheimer's, but she did uh, end up having a stroke. And they played um, Engelbert Humperdinck over and over, and she would be almost lucid for a few moments singing the words. And then she would go back into her, you know, unresponsive phase. And it was fascinating. But we know music is powerful. We know if we're not feeling good and we put a song on that we like, we feel better. We know it helps us think. We know it can reduce difficult behaviors. We know it can reduce stress and agitation. Look at all the things on this slide and it can improve our quality of life. So Use music to your advantage in the dental office. Understand what does that person like to listen to and use it. Nobody said our office has to smell like a dental office, but we certainly want it to smell like something the patient likes. So if you're using oils, I know you've all, all been in somebody's house who had some kind of candle burning and you walked in their house and it turned your stomach. <laughs> it's not the smell that you would put in your own house. So allow patients choices make it something that they enjoy smelling and that is soothing. So you have that option. Um, maybe they like to have some weight. Not everybody does. My son does not like this, but some people with autism may wear a weighted vest or may use a weighted blanket. And we have a lead apron in the dental office that we could offer. You're not gonna learn all this unless you ask all of these questions. We need to know how does that person communicate? Do they understand everything talking just the way I am? My son understands everything if I talk to him just like this. What he can't do is express. So his receptive language is very strong. He can understand, he just can't express it. And so he uses an iPad. It has changed his life to be able to pick things and show pictures of what he wants and find things that he wants. We used to have to use you know, all these little cards on these devices. And it was a nightmare if we didn't have the card with us and we were trying to figure out what it was he wanted. So does the person use some type of a device and could that be helpful? I'm not gonna read this screen to you. It is in your handout. The one thing I will say to you is the most painful thing for me when I was with my grandmothers and when I'm with my son is if someone came up to us and said, to me, Karen, how's Tommy been? And he's standing right next to me. Or the same thing with my grandmothers, when they would talk to me. And understandably, if I need to answer, tell the person, tell Tommy, Tommy, how are you? I'm so happy you're here today. Is it okay if I talk to mom about a few things that I need answers for? And he'll usually nod, right? It's okay. Um, but, but, these are little things, this list is very long and you have it in your handout, but they can be very powerful when it comes to communication. So a person with Alzheimer's, it's really gonna depend on how far the disease has progressed and you may need to make adjustments as the disease progresses when it comes to communication. So you gotta be in touch with the caregivers. You gotta ask about their abilities, not the things they can't do. And one of the things that worked great for my grandmothers <laughs> my one grandmother, my paternal grandmother, every time I would visit, she'd say, are you still doing that job? You have to travel all the time. Yes, Graham, I am. Five, not even five minutes later. Are you still doing that job? You have to travel all the time. So I used to write on a card, 
yes, Graham. And so <laughs> when I when she'd ask me over and over, I'd, I'd just point to the card. She'd look at the card and she'd be good. And after a while, she just stopped asking because she knew she had the answer in her hands. Uh, so visual cues, you know, giving the person the ability to hold up the card if they need a break or to hold up a card if they just want you to stop for a moment. It's really powerful to give someone control. It's really powerful to allow someone to see the plan visually. Even when it comes to toothbrushing, very often you'll hear, this person won't let me brush their teeth. Well, maybe they would. Maybe they don't understand a timer. Right? Maybe they don't understand I'm going to do this for two minutes, but with pictures, first I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this for a count of five, then we're going to take a break for a count of five, then I'm going to do this, and they can watch you go down the list of how this is happening and know that they're getting closer to the end. I always bring this with me, doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, because my son will always ask in the car, in the car. He loves to go for a ride in the car. So I have a card that says first the dentist, then the car. And similar to Alzheimer's, he will ask me over and over and over again. So I pick up the card and I can just point to it and he gets it. So again, pictures can be very, very helpful. But very often these individuals can't speak. And with Alzheimer's, they're losing that ability to communicate. So it is the behaviors. We have got to learn to listen to the behavior. The person's not acting out just to be nasty. What are they trying to tell me? Maybe it is just leave me alone for a moment. Maybe that's all that's needed, but it is their, their only means of communication. So if they're becoming more aggressive and aren't usually aggressive, is it pain possibly? Are they not eating like they used to? Because is it pain possibly? Really learning to listen to what's what you're seeing versus what you're hearing. Um, and again, just this is part of the form. You can ask all these questions to be able to understand what behaviors might you see. And you do want to know this in advance because very often people will have injuries and you're going to want to know, did they do that to themselves? Are they self-injurious or is someone doing that to them? Um, something to keep the person's hands busy also keeps their mind busy. Sometimes a warm towel um, under their neck in the dental chair, warm, moist towel can be very calming and soothing. But really here, we're trying to determine what is self-inflicted, and we're trying to really rule out any abusive behavior by a caregiver. Um, I want to shift gears here just a second because I want to make sure that there are, yes, okay, good, okay. I just wanted to be sure. I thought there were some images that I had um, hidden and I wanted to share with you. So why it's important in this population of individuals um, who are mentally challenged, these statistics are awful. More than 70% of women and 30% of men will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And they're 50% more likely to be victims of violent crimes. And very, very often, Sorry, the offenders are often their caregivers and I'm getting upset and I'm getting very personal with you right now. But two weeks ago, um, it was confirmed that my son was actually being abused by a caregiver in the home where he lives. So I'm sharing this very, very personal story with you to tell you this happens. These are not just statistics. These are people and it happens to them. And thank goodness it was someone else in the home who witnessed it and said something because that may not always be the case, right? People worry about their jobs. They worry they're going to get in trouble, um, but this happens. And the worst part about it is my son is self-injurious. And so very often, if he has marks on him, the assumption is that he did it to himself. This was him pinching his own face, right? Looks like chicken pox. And this is, he bites himself. He still does. He bites his shoulder on a regular basis. And so you want to know this in advance, because if this person shows up in your dental office, you want to know in advance, what are the things that are self-injurious? And we are mandated reporters, right? 
So if the person shows up and there's a mark and there's no explanation, then that's our job to report so that some it gets investigated. Here's another example, self-injurious. Tommy hits his ears. You saw in the picture earlier, he, his ears were covered, his arms are protected. This is an auricular hematoma. Within one day, it looks like this, okay? Um, it required three surgeries on this one ear. They actually sutured a cotton roll to the front and back of his ear. Uh, and when they removed it, it blew up again. Um, and then he needed some mattress sutures and it's back to a normal looking ear. If left alone, that looks like cauliflower ear. Uh, that's the last thing he needed was ears that looked like that. Uh, and then he went ahead and did it to the other ear. Tommy's required um, several hospitalizations. And I'm sharing this with you because we had to make a very, very difficult decision. Tommy's quality of life was horrible. Um, there was a lot of behaviors. He had no friends. He couldn't leave the house because he'd want to, and then he couldn't. Um, and my husband and I worried about what would happen when we were gone. And we knew we really needed to find a place where he could have opportunities to be with peers, to be in the community, to go out and, and enjoy his life. Um, no kid wants to spend the rest of their life necessarily with mom and dad. And someday mom and dad may be gone. Um, so while this was the most difficult decision my husband and I ever made, we did it um, to be as unselfish as possible. And I say that because if Tommy had stayed at home with us, he would have never been able to go to prom. <laughs> and this is him um, with a dear friend, Allie, who when she heard that his school was having a prom, she used to care for him when he was home. She begged us to take him to prom. <laughs> so he is blessed in his life to have some amazing people who have been part of his life for so many years. Um, and Allie um, had the privilege of taking him to prom. And he graduated last year at age 22. Uh, this is him on the left at 22. And here on the right was his most recent headshot, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> um, and so uh, talk about being proud. He was definitely a proud graduate at 22 years old. So his life is has been much more than I could, my husband and I could have ever given him, but really, really difficult decision to make. And so when you hear families who have loved ones with Alzheimer's, it, you know, it's the number one reason that they have to place their loved ones in nursing homes. And they, they can't keep them safe at home, right? Tommy's bigger and stronger than me. When he's self-injurious, I can't protect him. And these individuals with Alzheimer's also become resistant and combatant. And caregivers, really, they need somebody 24-7. You can't do that alone. Um, you need support. And so Alzheimer's is also the number one reason individuals are placed in nursing homes for that support. So when it comes to behaviors and specifically Alzheimer's, try not to take the behaviors personally. The calmer that you are, the calmer the person will be. Think about the pain perhaps as a trigger to the behaviors. Don't argue or try to convince, just accept those behaviors as part of the disease and do the best you can to work through it. Um, some modifications, we've talked about limiting time, we've talked about tell, show, do short appointments and with people with autism and even with people with Alzheimer's, the more you reward, I mean, maybe you, you know, go out, go out for a nice ride or go out to sit in the park or for Tommy, it's going for a ride in the car. Think about what is that motivation for that person um, that can help them through an appointment. Um, little bits at a time, um, but more often, right? Only do what you say you're going to do. That's part of being the trust building. What's very confusing for people with Alzheimer's and autism is to give three commands in one sentence. So if you say, um, open up, open big, open, 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 right? We want to just keep one command at a time, try to keep it simple, understand their communication abilities and choices, choices, choices. The more choices you give someone, the more likely they are to work with you instead of against you. And always try to end on a very positive note, telling 
you know, telling them how well they did, how excited you were to have them with you. Um, try not to stand over them. So always being at eye level, um, praising. You may need to ignore certain behaviors. It's okay to have the same people. It is helpful, but make sure they're always introduced to everyone in your practice in case that person needs to change. Um, singing and counting. Boy, with Tommy, if you tell him, he'll let you do pretty much anything you want. If you tell him you're going to do it for a count of five or a count of 10, he knows when 10 is, when that's it. Um, but for other people, you might say, you know, I'm going to sing the ABCs. When I'm done with the ABCs, we're done. Just think creatively how to help that person, how to calm them, how to help them to get through the amount of time they need to be with you. Um, and again, keeping things calm and using a very gentle and caring voice. So again, as Alzheimer's progresses, that person may forget how to brush or forget why it's even important. So they're going to need assistance. Those caregivers um, are going to need a hands-on approach and they're going to need your help for that. So I'm showing you this picture first because Tommy's oral hygiene started before he ever had a diagnosis of autism. Okay, so his routine was a power toothbrush and floss from when he had his first tooth. And you can say, Karen, you're a hygienist, that's why. But I would encourage all of you to develop relationships with the pediatricians in your community. Encourage them to send their patients to you as early as age one. If you develop these practices early on, why should the diagnosis of autism change anything? Because today, this is what oral hygiene looks like for Tommy. Now, again, he chooses to wear these things if he's feeling impulsive. So he did choose to put those things on his arms. But look at the fidget I've given him to play with in his left hand. He already knows what his reward is because you'll hear him say Papa and you'll hear him say in the car. But you'll also hear him say candy cane. I have a bag of flavored chapsticks. <laughs> he picks the flavor that he wants and I put the chapstick on his lips when we're done. So this is his routine. He's bigger than me now. So he, I used to stand behind him. Now he sits on the floor and all of his caregivers have this video and know that they can do this as well as I do. I want you to watch though. My fingers never go between his teeth ever. Okay. Yeah, we'll go in the car. Two. Ba -ba -ba. And pop is coming. Yep. Three. Four. Hey! We're doing good. We're almost at five. Okay, yes, five. Good job. Then we do six. Okay. Then we do seven. Eight. We got stuff stuck in there. <laughs> Just came out. Nine. Ten. Okay, we got a floss, okay? Real quick. And then we'll do some candy cane chapstick, okay? Yeah, pop is coming. Good job. Okay, that's one. Watch when 10 comes. And excellent. He's Some done. <laughs> he's done. It, it, and notice it's routine. It's what he's always been used to. Counting to 10 with the toothbrush, counting to 10 with the floss. And anybody can get in there and do the exact same thing that I did because he'll let them. It's been his routine since he was less than one year old. I don't talk to patients about brushing and flossing though. I talk about daily full mouth disinfection. They've heard everything about flossing and brushing, right? But we need to help them understand that we're gonna talk to them about a device that they're gonna use to apply a medication. The device is a toothbrush. The medication is the toothpaste. 
And by talking to them differently about this and helping them understand that this is, you know, this is wound care. If that patient with Alzheimer's or autism has bleeding gums, they have a wound. They have an oral wound. And if you write the medical order that they need wound care, nursing will then get involved if they live in a nursing home or in a group home. And that's what you need. You need to have accountability. So truly, um, this is wound care and it needs to be done on a regular basis. There are brushes that in one stroke, if you need to use a manual brush, the person will not accept a power brush. These are great brushes. They cover three surfaces of the tooth in one stroke. If you have a limited amount of time, this is what you want. Power is going to be your best bet if you can get that person in baby steps, even if it's for one second, five days, and then you increase it to two seconds, for five days and then you go to three seconds, eventually they're gonna let you in their mouth longer and longer and longer with baby steps. And there are all kinds of flossing devices. The one over on the right is the one you saw me using, but there are so many options on the market. And even this type of device, if all else fails, the person may actually accept this. So we have to have accountability. We have to know who is going to be responsible for oral hygiene. We want that in the medical record. We want accountability. Where there's accountability, there's likely to be action. We need to make fluoride varnish our best friend. If that's the only thing that you do in that dental appointment, in that first appointment, fluoride loves to live in the plaque. So get that fluoride in there. Let it do some work until you reappoint them, not too far later for another short appointment and working in baby steps. Understanding that some of the medications may cause not just dry mouth, but may cause dysphagia, dysgusia. We need to know what those side effects are, but there are ways we can address serostomia. My son's medical records state that he will get two cubes of this gum and that they will cut each cube in half. So he gets four doses a day of xylitol gum. And it doesn't have to be this brand. There are many other brands of xylitol gum and mints, but you want that on their medication order, okay? If we have to refer patients, you know, I love Thomas Edison once said, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Try not to give up. Your office may be the only place that this individual has ever felt comfortable. So if you do feel, I mean, th think about the impact that this can have. Many individuals who work with people who have special health care needs talk about it in terms of a divine reward. And Paul Glassman once said, it's hard to describe the elation one can feel. When a patient who doesn't speak to anyone speaks to you. So I'm going to share my favorite quote and then a story with you. Um, and then we're done. But I want you to know that to the world, you might just be one person. But to one person, you just might be the world. And many of you, if you've heard my course before, have heard this story. But, you know, when Tommy turned six years old, it was one of the hardest times of our lives because he was still not speaking. And we were told that if he did not speak by the time he was six, that he would never speak. And I will never forget the day he turned six, six years old because he wasn't speaking. And I thought to myself, what's going to happen when I'm not there to speak for him anymore? So Tommy's favorite person in the world still today is Mickey Mouse. And I looked at my husband and I said, you know what? I said, we need to go, we need to get away and we need to go to Disney World. I think that's the medicine that we need. So we went and we really wanted to have some time for him to spend time with Mickey Mouse, you know, so we thought we'd book a character breakfast and then he'd have, be able to have a meal and maybe Mickey would sit with us for a few minutes. Well, back then, I don't know why, but they didn't have Mickey available at any of the breakfasts. He, he was only at the dinners. And I don't know how many of you remember or have recently been to Disney World with your loved ones. 
you're in the park all day waiting in lines. It's hot and you hate each other by dinner time. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, we're going to do this at dinner. This is going to be a nightmare. But we were determined. So we went to the dinner and the dining hall was like a huge ballroom. I'll never forget the characters came out. We were in one corner of the dining room and Mickey was one of the characters. There was Donald Duck and all the others. He was at the opposite corner of the dining room. And I thought, this is going to take forever. I'm going to die. So as every other character comes to the table, I'm trying to rush them along. I'm like, okay, Chip and Dale, let's keep moving. Come on, Donald. Let's, let's get this process moving. Well, we had our cameras ready. And finally, Mickey comes walking over to the table. And we're ready to take some photos. And my son, Tommy, looks up at him and goes, and we started screaming, oh my God. And all the people in the dining room are looking at us. And the character Mickey is like backing away from our table. Like what just happened? And I walked over to Mickey and I said, you don't understand. He's never said a word in his life. And he just said Mickey Mouse. So to the world, you might be just one person. But to one person, you just might be the world. And imagine if a patient who doesn't speak to anyone actually speaks to you. Um, his, his brother kept saying to me, mom, he said two words. He said two words. <laughs> so excited. And even today, still a huge fan of Mickey Mouse, still one of his favorites. So I want to finish where I started. We don't come this way, but once. Enjoy an experience of a lifetime. How often do you get a chance to impact a life in a major way? And you can, with this patient population of patients with autism and Alzheimer's, you can profoundly impact the quality of their lives. So I have a few minutes for some questions. So I'm going to open up the chat box um, for some Q&A. Um, but I want to start by saying, uh, before we jump into the Q&A session, I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for wanting to be here and for wanting to understand how you can help this patient population truly from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Um, so let me, um, I think there's a Q&A box here, so maybe I should start with that. There's also some comments in the chat. So, um, so these are kind of long. All right, let me see. Um, you should be very proud. Let's see, using your education experience with other dental professionals. To, I had to use my profession to help children as well. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, are there daycares for these children so parents can take time off? There are. Um, they are unfortunately having the same issues in the world today as every other profession. And the waiting lists today for families who need this support has gotten out of control because people have left their jobs. And so getting talent and getting the right talent, um, there are programs, but they're hard. And when you think one in 44 children, there aren't enough to support really all the children that need it. Um, found a technique for children with lack of toothbrushing technique um, for children who won't stay still when they have their head on your lap to brush their teeth, lie the child down on the floor, straddle their torso with your knees as you kneel on the floor facing them so that your bottom can hold them down. When they scream, your, their mouth is open so you can brush. <laughs> And that works very well for children. I would agree. Um, as they become adults, um, that's really where the bigger challenge lies. But that's um, definitely something to consider. Uh, for an adult who has autism, as you recommended, for the caregiver to talk on the phone the day before, what legal documentation is needed? Um, thank you for this educational, compassionate lecture. Uh, I would say that if you have documentation that they are the legal guardian or caregiver, which is what you would need to provide their treatment. Um, I'm not an attorney, so I, I can't advise on that, but that would be my guess. <laughs> um, congratulations, Tommy. Thank you. Uh, daily con constant gum chewing cause bone loss. Oh, interesting. So he does not chew the gum for more than maybe a minute. <laughs> We're lucky if we get the xylitol in the few places that it needs to be, but I agree that we would not want daily constant chewing of the gum. Uh, so that would something that would be something that needs to be controlled. 
Um, thank you for the education. Thank you so much. Thank you for these words of encouragement. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is a wonderful, thank you. I mean, this really for me, it's not easy um, to share my story and especially late at night, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> But um, especially in light of we've had a pretty tough couple of weeks with my son. So so I do appreciate the encouragement. Um, let me look in the chat because I was looking in the Q&A. So I want to just make sure there's nothing in the chat. Um, so let's see. That's all. Oh, chat is not available. Okay. So this was just um, someone said go Patriots. Yay. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so that's all I have. I don't know, Dr. DeCessino, uh, Dean Myers, if anybody, um, if you had any other comments for the audience, but thank you again, everyone. Appreciate you. The only comment I have is uh, Karen. We know each other for a long time. Inspiration. Thank you. And I'm happy you took some time to go through the Q&A so that I could get rid of the tears from listening to the Mickey Mouse story. I've heard it before and it just always gets me. It's just an incredible story. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Karen, for, for sharing your experience, um, your wisdom. And uh, we really, really very much appreciate you being here. Um, we do have our, our next series, uh, next in the series, which will be in November on the 16th. So we'll definitely be sending out announcements as we get closer. And for those of you who are looking for your CE credits, uh, you will receive an email tomorrow uh, with your wherever you registered. And um, then there'll be a survey that you can send back to Stephen Zellig. And once he receives that, he'll be able to send you your certificates. So thank you, everyone. And have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.